Dr. Kinane is a pediatric pulmonologist who has a particular interest in pulmonary genetics, including Myrie syndrome. He graduated from medical school at, Uni at University College Dublin in Ireland in 1983. After completing his pediatric residency, he moved to the US in 1987 for specialty training. He completed a pediatric residency at the University of Texas Southwestern Medical School in Dallas. He then completed a pediatric pulmonary fellowship at Harvard and Massachusetts General Hospital. He remained at the Mass General Hospital where he is the chief of pediatric pulmonary and sleep medicine. He is seen as a leader in the field of pediatric pulmonology. His clinical focus has been the genetic basis of each patient's disease, which has important implications for the prognosis and treatment. He developed several gene panels for inherited pulmonary disorders. He has taken the screening one step further and developed a pediatric pulmonary genetic clinic. This multidisciplinary clinic provides up-to-date genetic analysis, phenotyping, counseling, and cost-effective care. Indeed, it is the first such clinic in the nation. I wanna wel um, welcome you, Dr. Kinane. Welcome to the conference. Uh, put my video on. Thank you for having me. Um, look, it's a pleasure to be here and uh, to follow those two elegant talks. It's a hard act to follow. And, and Angela's done a wonderful job uh, enunciating all aspects of disease, which is really wonderful to see. Uh, I do have some conflict of interest related to genetics. So I should probably say to the bird, uh, sorry. Um, sorry, my, uh, do, I do actually, I was the PI on the corrector therapies for Serepta pharmaceuticals for Duchenne's muscular dystrophy, the oligonucleotide therapy, and I'm presently co-PI on the gene therapy trial for uh, Kahneman's disease, which is a neuro neurogenetic disorder. Now, I'm not going to talk too much about this, but I am going to just say a few words uh, just from a pulmonary aspect. We've talked about signaling and this pathway has been shown to us many times so far. Um, but I wanted to go all the way down here. Um, what does it do in the lungs? Um, SMAG4 clearly has some um, uh, important regulatory role in the development of lungs. And uh, it does raise some interesting questions when you look with hindsight at the data that I'm gonna show you. Um, so with hindsight, you have to stay you. We will talk about scarring a little bit. And we're actually gonna talk about the short bones a bit too. Uh, so scarring fractures, which is, uh, which is not what I'm gonna talk about. And then we'll, we'll finally end up when we talk about sleep, which is a huge issue here. Now, the, the problem with pulmonary is uh, the symptoms are not specific. And uh, we brought up a few of them, and I didn't add shortness of breath here, but cough, wheeze, strider, croup are common in the general population. And if the big issue is this, is 20% of the pediatric population will wheeze in their lifetime. That doesn't mean that they have uh, any specific disease or you just got a viral illness. So applying common uh, symptoms and making them specific for Myri is a challenge. Um, now, for example, you know, if you talk about croup a little bit, uh, it's extremely common in the population and um, about one third of kids develop it and about one in five develop recurring croup, uh, and they're perfectly fine. Uh, so you just have to, uh, so if this is, I just want to emphasize what uh, Angela and Mark said before me, that's the reason why large databases are important. So you can actually find out the specificity of the symptoms. And um, I'm gonna focus a little bit on testing beforehand. Now we did talk about uh, airway stenosis from the uh, coanal stenosis, that means small back of your nose, and then tracheal stenosis. Um, now this is a picture, a well publicized picture uh, from one of the three case reports that are out there. Um, now it's pretty clear, you know, this is just to show you the, the examination is here. 
to see a kink here and the, the trachea is supposed to go down here like this and then you're supposed to go see it this way. So there's clearly another um, narrowing here. Now, when Angela asked me to join the group, uh, I, I was expecting to see a lot of this. I was expecting to see a lot of this uh, because uh, scarring is going to be a big issue. Now, I did know something that which called very easy to screen for, actually. It's very easy to screen for. Now, we do see uh, scarring of the airway and tracheal stenosis a, a lot, um, particularly uh, Mass general and mass ionier, we see a lot. And I would say on an average clinic, I do see, you know, on a clinic for a whole day, I would probably see one case, be it old or new. So it's not unusual to see us. Now, it is extremely easy to, and I'll look around my stuff here, um, it's extremely easy to scan for. Now, over here on the right, that's what trach this is the vocal cords here, and that's what it looks like. And it's called sort of subglottic stenosis. And, it's, and very well established, maybe, and there's even a scoring system for the cotton system. Now, what happens is when you breathe in and out, this is what we do a lung function test, you breathe out the nice curve like this, nice curve like this. And then if you have tracheal stenosis in a breathing test, it's squared, it's squared. And that's what happens, it's squared. Um, no, so now we've been looking at the PFTs in our group. There were 42 patients, as Angela pointed out, and, and I'll get back to some of the PFTs later. Um, we haven't seen the squaring, to be honest. We have not seen the squaring, to be honest. Now, it, I think this probably reflects we're seeing a younger population. I'm as, as pointed out, I'm a pediatric pulmonologist. I suspect it's because we're seeing a younger population, but uh, but it is interesting, it's easy to screen for. And you could actually um, have a, a screening, a very, very uh, instant screening when somebody shows up. And going back to the ours, we just don't see it. Uh, now, now, what we do see actually, um, when the uh, patients come to see us in the clinic, um, uh, we have the benefit of CAT scans being done for cardiac reasons, looking at the blood vessels. Uh, sorry. Uh, they will, and what you see, um, what you see, uh, so you can get the look at hindsight of what's going on. Um, now when we looked at the hindsight, um, so we took, we had 23 CAT scans that we had adequate data on that the patient wasn't moving. And in six of them, we saw this. See this white, this is darker area. Now this is called hyperinflation. Now to a pediatric pulmonologist, that's a form of what we call lower emphysema. And the usual causes are small airway narrowing, uh, small airway narrowing. So we might be seeing some small airway narrowing going on in some patients. And we saw in six or 23 patients, now, um, we see it in various locations in the six of them. Um, now, the, truthfully, the, the way the CAT scan is done is not optimized to see it. So what you have to do is take a big breath in and then take a big, uh, do a CAT scan and then take a big breath out to do a CAT scan. And that's hard to do uh, in patients with Myers syndrome. So there may be more of this than we know about. So uh, this is something we're keeping an eye on. Uh, we've seen, two remarkable cases recently, which had a fair amount of it, uh, which had a fair amount of it. So um, it's interesting, uh, as we get to understand it and we get collect unbiased data, it's, it's pretty, we're seeing new stuff. Now, the thing that has been talked about a lot uh, is the restrictive lung disease. Now, restrictive lung disease is a, a concept uh, that's hard to understand sometimes. All it means is you've got small lungs. Now, this is an example of one of our myri patients up here. I need to put my myri patients up here. Now, what we measure is these volumes that you breathe in and out of your lungs. This is how much you breathe out of your lungs, and this is how much you breathe out in one second. 
And you can see in this patient with Myers syndrome, it's 58% to 62%. Now, this is taken as a reflection that the lungs are small. Now, you can get at it for many reasons. Uh, you can get at it for many reasons. Now, we have had the benefit uh, in our, of having eight patients who had CT scans and PFTs. So you won't be able to correlate these. You won't be able to correlate these things and say, why do they have small lungs? Uh, for the first time, we'll, we'll be able to do that. Now, PFTs, because uh, I deal with children, uh, are hard to do in Myers syndrome because they have facial sensitivities. And the, if, if the autism is aspect is significant, they're really hard to do. And uh, Pat and Lena in our group, uh, they could get anyone to do PFTs. Um, now, and it's very, very important to get them right. So uh, it's just hard to do. And we think we'd have more, but we don't because of these facial issues. Now, what we're seeing is um, that we see an average force file capacity that's up here of 67% on the eight patients that we've done. Two of them had areas of hyperinflation. That's like what we talked about. Now, as I said, We've had eight of them with CAT scans and PFTs. Now, based on the CAT scan, it's unexplained by lung disease. Uh, it really is unexplained by lung disease. To get uh, PFTs that give you 67% of function, and if there was a lung cause, it's obvious, to the obvious. So then you have to explore other mechanisms for this restrictive pattern. Are the lungs small because of reduced development? Is the ribcage small? And I'll talk about this. Are the muscles weak? And they can't do it. Um, and then which call it, we'll talk about this interstitial lung disease. And I want to bring it up a little bit. Um, now, this is a, a lot of, you've heard about this before. And this is one of the previous studies and case report looking at interstitial lung disease and a, a biopsy. Now, what you see here, now this is the air sacs here, and this is the air sacs here. You see this thickening, right? These are about 10 times thicker than they should be. Uh, now, we, if, you, if this was present in our patients, okay, we'd have seen it on CAT scan and we're not. So this kind of suggests that this case report is isolated. Uh, we're just taking it further. Uh, we had this one, case two from the star case, which I think is the previous one as well. And then we had this uh, uh, patient who passed away in South Carolina who had some subpleural fibrosis. Now we've had 23 patients with ca good CAT scans that we could look at and we didn't see it. Uh, now, in fact, because of my, one of my interests is, uh, is fibrotic and lung disease and interstitial lung disease, we tend to overcall it. Um, I think we may be too sensitive to overcalling it. If, you, if you'd ask me, I, I think we overcall it in our center. We're just not seeing it. Um, now, could this mean that we have to wait till later in life for it to happen? So say, for example, as Angela and Mark kindly said beforehand, do you need to get an insult that triggers the fibrosis in the lungs? Well, we don't know that, and uh, we don't know that. Um, now, there is some upside, to be honest. Uh, now, this is from one of the patients from our clinic. I just want to show this is the heart here, and usually we're focused on the heart, and we usually focus on the lung. But these are the ribs. The ribs are short and thick. Now, this is very subjective. Um, and you remark it. Now, we see other things like storage disorders, before they call it hunters and herders, we see it. And um, now, these are probably the same degree of thickness as hunters and herders. Um, but it's interesting, the ribs are thicker. Um, I think it, it, it probably goes with that the ribs are thicker. And, and this is very subjective. And there really is no criteria or uh, gold standards for saying your ribs are thick, it's very subjective. Uh, the other thing that strikes us uh, on all CAT scans, now look, if you, now clearly this uh, patient had some um, uh, overweight, but the lungs look small. 
I see it in all of them. They look small. Uh, again, super subjective, super, super subjective. And so it does raise the possibility that the ribs are compressing and it truly is a developmental issue that we didn't look at. Now it's been well known that SMAD4, it does regulate the development of lungs. Now, just to, just to make things, uh, not trying to focus too much on it, the um, restrictive lung disease is common. Now, when we talk about in the background, um, most people say to me, um, would that impact exercise performance? The answer is no. Yes, if you're competing for the Olympic games. Now, and most people who exercise and really push it to the limit, they have close to 40% of their lung reserve left when they stop. And the reason you stop is because you run out of cardiac reserve. And so it's really, really unusual. So um, they shouldn't be really limited, uh, certainly as children, and later, but it could develop later. Now, could it develop later? No, we do see case reports and some chatter here that which call uh, shortness of breath later in life. Now, is that because um, you're, you get other diseases and your lungs are small to start with, you have no reserve? I think it's probably true. And, and could you be getting this, what, what we call this uh, focal areas of emphysema? Uh, I wonder, we need to look into that a little more particularly in the older patients. Um, and we probably need to work them up quite a bit better than we do. Now, so what we're seeing is true interstitial lung disease is rare. Now, what's happened in interstitial lung disease in the last um, two years is that um, there, there are therapeutic options that we've never had before. And two of them have been approved by the FDA. So uh, mainly aimed at fibrotic lung disease. So it's really interesting for therapeutic options at this moment in time. So we do think the world uh, for restrictive lung disease is, is changing. And now we may, we may have options because um, most people don't realize that in adults, what we call true, they call it usual interstitial uh, lung disease, which means fibrosis of the lungs. It's relatively common. Uh, in the population, uh, it's very common in the population. So it's pharma it's very attractive area for pharmaceutical companies. So uh, this is an area we think we can see changes in the future. Now I'm going to switch over to sleep. Uh, as you know, I do sleep, a, a bit of immunology and pulmonary medicine. And um, what jumps out is um, when the Patients come to see us. I was just expecting when this all started was uh, it was all, I was going to talk to them all the time about exercise intolerance, coughing and wheezing. But this is not what we saw. Um, the most dominant pressure is what you call sleep for these families and uh, sleep. Um, now, and then I'll talk about obstructive sleep apnea a, a bit in, in a second. Um, now, when you look back at the notes from ours, and we haven't documented it well. Now, this is a cycle, this is from Humphreys in Southampton over here. Now, people and patients with, my, with autism uh, have short sleep cycle. Now, just to give you an example, uh, some patients with autism can sleep for five hours a night. Um, now it's a real, real problem. It's a real, real problem in the autism world. And, um, and uh, it's, it's traumatic. Like if you put a child to bed uh, at 8 p.m. Uh, and they're getting up at 1 a.m. for the day. And it's completely disruptive to families. Now we do see this. Uh, this seems to be more overrepresented in Myrie syndrome than it appears in general autism. Now, usually we call this short sleep cycle, um, short sleep cycle. Um, now it is very dysfunctional and I'll show you, and it's really, really hard to treat. Uh, really, really hard to treat. Um, now we see it about 50% that, uh, that we documented and, we're, and we're, we are forever talking about, uh, and uh, how I used 
this is I should probably uh, describe it more rigidly as I should, which call that. Well, if you need medications, it's a good sign that you need it. Now, now this is, and I'm sorry, this is faded out a little bit. What happens is as you get older, you need less sleep and uh, you need less sleep. So, uh, you know, so when you're up into, you know, like most of us do fine. Now, down here, most of the children with Myri are down in this range and sleeping four or five hours of sleep at night is, is not a great idea for, for development. Now, see, uh, so of the ones that we documented and we get into detail, 14 of 19 had it. Uh, now, as I said, it's really difficult to treat. And I'm gonna talk about that for a little bit. and. Uh, you end up, uh, if you do sleep medicine, being very good at medications. Uh, now it's incredibly disruptive to families. And uh, now the problem is if you sleep for five hours a night and you're supposed to be sleeping for 10, it, it probably isn't good for learning. Uh, so you have to think about it. Now, effective therapies, uh, we, we always start out with melatonin and then we go to trazodone. Uh, now, invariably, we end up going to trazodone and then no trazodone. Now, there are other options that uh, we talk about a lot, and um, and there are therapeutic options that are uh, conflicting, shall I say. Um, now, for example, clonidine uh, would be a good option in these patients who have ADHD as well. So clonidine uh, would have been good. Now, the problem with that is it lowers blood pressure. And if they're taking an ACE inhibitor already, it's going to lower it more. So it's a bit of a challenge giving them uh, this, although it may be a good option uh, for some patients with a combination of ins uh, short sleep cycle and insomnia and ADHD. Now, the other one that uh, is very attractive, actually, is gaining a lot. This, this, uh, this medication called hydroxyzine. Uh, it is an old fashioned antihistamine, but it is increasingly recognized as a good uh, for prolonging sleep, but it's also an effective therapy for what's called anxieties. So this is becoming uh, increasingly used. Um, hydroxyzine is increasingly used, um, mainly because uh, the combination of anxieties and a lot, of, uh, and uh, we'll have to see what happens with Myri, but the, uh, Anxiety seems to be a big issue for a lot of these children and, uh, and this, focus, this may become an option. Now, we always talk about SSRIs and SNRIs. Now, and generally, we like these uh, for sleep. Um, and particularly when they're combined with behavioral issues, we really like them. Now, the, with Myers syndrome and a short sleep cycle, they create uh, a very difficult issue for us. Um, when you take an SSRI, you just um, Prozac, just simple Prozac, for an example. Now, normally what happens is you and I go into REM sleep. And, you know, if we sleep, if we go to bed at 10 o'clock, we go into REM sleep about 2 a.m. or something like that. And then we get most of our REM sleep till about, uh, you know, till about 6 a.m. Now, now what happens is if we take an SRI and SNRI is that which call you shift REM sleep later in the night. And if you have a short sleep cycle, then what happens is uh, you might push it off the other end. And uh, so we always worry about this. We always worry about this. And particularly REM sleep is the deep rejuvenative sleep. So this is a complex problem and it has huge implications for uh, uh, people's uh, lives and uh, Outcome. So, something that we probably need to put more thought into and uh, uh, come up with a structural plan, uh, a structural plan that we, we should focus on. Now, we do, you do have to end up calling people that they see it back home just to see what's going on with their SSRIs and behavior. It's, it's very, very important to get an understanding what their behavior is uh, when you deal with these medications. Now, the next thing I was going to talk about is what's called uh, obstructive sleep apnea. Now, this is just showing you an example. Now, this sort of fascia is, um, that you see in Myers syndrome, and you probably recognize it, is, um, should be associated with severe obstructive sleep apnea. Uh, 
should be associated with severe obstructive sleep apnea. And when you look in the mouth, uh, there, what we do is we, um, we look at the mouth and we have a scoring system called Marlin Party. Um, and it's one to, you know, one to four. And, um, and generally what we're trying to do is uh, score the mouth. And effectively, patients with myelia all have small mouths, uh, all have small mouths. Now, when we see the patients, we obviously don't do sleep studies because what you have to do is keep them overnight and uh, the whole lot. Now, we've also find out, you know, because if you have autism, uh, most sleep centers around the country are not uh, facile at doing sleep studies in patients with autism. And this is a common problem. Now, because we have a huge autism center at the MGH, it's, uh, we see a lot of them, I would say close to 30% of patients we're doing sleep clinic. I, doing a sleep lab uh, or have, aut have autism or some autistic features. Um, so it's very, very, um, so we get used to them. And even for us, it's really difficult to do. Um, most of the patients are happy with the, uh, some just won't sleep, uh, some won't sleep. But after the second time, they usually do, they get used to the staff. Now, 25% of them had sleep studies that we saw. Now, we weren't, now it's hard to get, uh, what's hard to do is it's, uh, Angela says it's, uh, it's, it's, with the increased use of EPIC, you can get most things, but sleep studies are relatively hard to get on EPIC, to be honest, because most of them are actually done by private companies rather than in which call uh, hospitals at this moment in time. Now this is just to show you what we look at in sleep studies. Um, this is, you know, uh, this is where you're, air going in and out your nose, your chest going up and down. And this is what we call central apnea. So what happens is your chest doesn't go up and down and then there's no airflow. This is your chest going up and down and there's less airflow. So this is, this is more obstruction. So we look for two things, central and obstruction. And then we have this thing called partial obstruction. So you got movement here and partial airflow. This is airflow. And you can see uh, it's amazing at the which part. Now, they're very realistic, and the, the ladies in the lab are fantastic at doing these, um, fantastic at doing these. Now, what happens is around the country, most people have their sleep studies done in an adult lab, and the criteria for obstructive sleep apnea is different. So the apnea apopnea event in mild obstructive sleep apnea is because this is the number of apnea events and shallow breathing events per hour. And the one to five is mild, and you see the adults is higher. So, um, so you have to be a little careful that, you know, uh, that we're not missing these. I do think we should do more sleep studies. Now, um, I think definitely we should do more sleep studies. Um, now, but even with sleep studies, and I'll just go through this briefly, even with sleep studies, um, even with sleep studies, uh, we are looking for uh, corrected things. Now, now, the story with Myri is we're not seeing it to the same degree of frequency as we would expect. And there might be a couple of explanations for that. But if we see it, what we're looking at, this is the tonsils here, these are the adenoids here, and this is, you know, your palate expander here, and I'll just talk about it. This is your allergic rhinitis here. Now, what we're trying to do here is, uh, what we look at, we say, we're not directly treating the Myri per se, is we're taking out the things that obstruct your airway. We take out the things that obstruct your airway. Um, take out things that, sorry, and tonsils and adenoids is the first choice. Now, the reason why tonsils and adenoids, and this is, and this is from what you call Mitchell, and it basically what happens is, um, if you take the tonsils and adenoids out, 82% uh, of kids resolve their obstructive sleep apnea, which we call the OSA. Now it's less so in syndromes, but it's not bad in syndromes because 50% of them do, 50% do, um, not bad in syndromes neither. Now these, we have to think about. Um, around the country, um, palate expanders are not uh, used for sleep apnea in pediatrics as much as we should. Now we like to do them before the sutures close. Uh, now here's the study from Pirelli. And basically, this is, you know, if you had a palate expander yourself, you'll know exactly. This is when they put it in. This is half ways, and this is the whole way. 
And then they have the, they did the very well, the apnea popping again, it was 12. They did intermediate position and then it went down. So more and more we do palate expanders. More and more we do it palate expanders. And, and, and Myri seems a good example of it. Now, when all of that fails, and particularly with somebody with Myri, uh, we do these things called distractions. Now, these are major surgeries, and we haven't done any of them in Myri. We've done them in many other syndromes, actually. We've done them in many other syndromes, and we routinely do them. And there's two ways of doing it. You can move the jaw forward, or you can move the center of the face forward. Now, these are massive surgeries. Um, massive surgeries and have not been done in Myri, mainly for, um, because of worries about scarring and so on. They just haven't been done, uh, or this is not obvious to us. Um, so basically what we're seeing is more and more, um, more and more, uh, they would call it, and the distraction work really, really well. Uh, we usually see kids who have what we call microgenadia, which is small jaw, and the rates are fantastic. The rates are fantastic. And uh, rates are fantastic. Uh, the numbers are really, really good with this. Now, it's probably less of an option here, probably less of an option here because now the other thing uh, I, I've been thinking about is that um, and I've said more or less of an option because of increased scarring, but it might be more of an option, if, particularly if you move the central part of the face forward for people who have quaaludes narrowing. So, uh, if you've generally got cranial narrowing, moving the center part of the face forward, although it sounds incredibly uh, uh, crude, uh, could be quite useful. Now we do a lot of this in other syndromes like Cousins, um, but it's, uh, it may be an option in the future that we have to think about. Um, we have to think about. Now this is CPAP, I won't talk about this, but we call it positive area pressure and everybody knows these machines. And um, now the, the problem with CPAP and and particularly if you have some artistic features, is uh, they're not well tolerated. They're just not well tolerated because of the facial sensitivities. And so uh, we haven't seen anybody so far uh, that we have documented that is using CPAP and is using CPAP, but generally on the long story short. Now, now the future direction, specific therapies as opposed to sports therapies, and I, I echo what, completely what Angela and Mark have said just before me. Uh, but what I do is the uh, supportive therapies here, but I can see that which called the future is bright. The future is bright, um, but focusing on this. And I think the takeaway message for me is, uh, is the sleep. Um, I didn't think I would be talking mo mostly about sleep, but it, it does turn out to, uh, when the patient comes to see her, and Angela will vouch for this, is uh, uh, I spend 70 to 80% of my time talking about sleep and trying to get an understanding of that and trying to uh, match the medications, if you need medications, to the medications you're already on. And so that's usually the challenge straight up. That's usually the challenge straight up. And trying to use uh, medications for dual purposes, if you can, for dual purposes, if you can. And again, thank you, everybody. Thank you for having me. Thank you so much, Dr. Kinane. That was great. I have a couple of questions that came across for you. Um, the first one was, what would you say are the top priorities for research from your perspective in pulmonology? I tell you, as I've got into, because uh, I do, I'm doing one of the, can the cannabis trial at the moment for gene therapy. I do think we need to be getting at the corrective part. Um, I think the research aspects that I would focus on is doing better CAT scans on the older patients with uh, uh, on the older patients with Myri and seeing what really is the lung disease there. Are we seeing what well, we see this uh, small airway disease that seems to be jumping out? Is, is that what so I would say better CAT scans. Um, I would be the number one thing, and particularly in older patients, so we can get an idea um, what the prognosis is uh, and form lifetime guidelines. And I would do, in, you know, I would say, I would do inspiratory and expiratory CAT scans 
and it wouldn't be a huge imposition. It would not be a huge imposition. So now for drug therapy specifically aimed at um, lung disease and fibrosis, I don't think we have to do anything there, actually. I do think uh, that Myri could actually be a, an attractive uh, syndrome for the FDA because fibrotic lung disease is very high on the FDA at this moment. It's, just, it's a relatively orphan drug. Uh, I mean, orphan in that there's no drug spread. It's a common disease. So finding a syndrome that gives fibrosis of the lung, should it give fibrosis of the lung, is attractive to drug companies because the uh, you can intervene early. So I do think that we call from the fibrotic lung disease. I think from the uh, obstructive sleep apnea and the uh, point of view, I do think um, getting a better understanding of where the obstruction is, is a, a big deal. I do think having better CAT scans of the upper airways is a good idea. However, there is a new technology that's uh, much easier to do and it might be better. Uh, there's a thing called impulse oscillometry, which means you put an ultrasound probe in the nose and you can measure how narrow the airway is. Now that is quite attractive because kids can do it without cooperating. So I do think that's the way well. Now there's an interesting study, um, it's done in uh, Toronto, and um, now and it, it can measure resistance in the upper airways. So I do think that's worth looking at. And I do think, you know, if we do define obstructive sleep apnea as a big issue, I do think getting our craniofacial people involved and looking at, um, looking at mid facial issues and getting their insight um, very early on is a good idea, is a really good idea. And particularly if we define an airway at risk. And what I mean an airway at risk of obstructive sleep apnea, an airway with uh, that small. Uh, now, and the reason for this is if you have obstructive sleep apnea, if you have severe obstructive sleep apnea, uh, even if you don't have Myrie syndrome, increase your risk of stroke and heart disease later. So I do think taking these on early on in a syndrome that is um, is cardiac prone, uh, shall I put it? delicately is cardiac prone is worth getting ahead of. So do, uh, that's where I'd be putting my money. Now we, we are the mass general have advantage. We do have one of these machines uh, for measuring upper airway flow. And I, I do think we should probably change our CAT scan protocol if we could um, to look at lung disease. I didn't expect much, but we may want to do them differently. We may want to do them differently. Great, yeah. Well, you answered the second question in that in that answer. So thank you so much for your thorough response. And, and thank you so much for taking the time out this weekend. Thank you so much.